Welcome back to our third episode of Samsy Month. For the next two episodes, we're going to have Ginny Lee, who's going to be walking us through how Alzheimer's research is bringing us uh, together medical imaging with genomic data. So two of the biggest big data medical applications living happily together in one room. And this is this first part is audio only, but in the second part next week, uh, she's whipping out the great visual material that you'd expect from a medical imaging expert. So if that sounds good, don't forget to subscribe, hit that bell button, and uh, so you hear when Ginny's next episode comes out. And with that, Ginny Lee of SAMSI. Jinyi, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your research and the medical domains that you work in? First of all, thank you, Glenn, for your invitation for this interview. Uh, it's very nice and uh, it's a very good opportunity for me to share my research work. Uh, my name is Xinyi. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at SMC, uh, the Statistical and Applied Mathematical Sciences Institute, the full name. And I'm also affiliated with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and working with Dr. Michael Kosaruk. Two years ago, I got my PhD degree of statistics at Iowa State University. And my thesis work is about the analysis for the data with complex features. So it's a very broad and general name. What I did during my PhD is mainly about statistical genetics. As you know, for Iowa, famous for the coin and the peak, and the projects I'm working on is mainly about the analysis for the coin data. To be specific, it's about the genome-wide association study that's linking certain phenotypes and genotypes with a coin or with a maze. And in terms of the statistical methodology, I mainly use the non-parametric regression, the functional data analysis, and the sparse learning for the analysis. And after I came to SAMC, I transferred my research uh, area a little bit to the precision medicine. So right now, my research work focuses on the study on precision medicine that incorporating the imaging features. So I have done one project with it, and I'm currently ongoing several works related with this topic. Well, that's really cool. So you made a jump from looking at the genomics of corn. I guess that means making sure that the crops are more robust and have the types of features like productivity and disease resilience um, and sort of like pest resilience that you want. Um, yes, actually, the phenotype we care about, about about the coin is to some phenotypes might be related with the genotypes, but we are not know, we're not clear about the association. And these features we care about could be like the yield of the coin, as you mentioned, the productive things. So we want to figure out that which type of the genotypes that can lead to the high yield, high product of the coin. Cool. And were there other phenotypes that you're looking at other than yield? To be specific, in the project, we are looking at uh, there's one special tissue in the coin, or we say maize, called the uh, SAM tissue, which is the full name is the shoot apical meristem. It is a tissue that can control the growth of this plant. When it is located in the root part, it, could, it is called the root apical meristem. When it is located in the shoot part, it is called shoot apical meristem, or in short, SAM. So we got some measurement for the SAM tissue, the cell. So we can see there are certain genotypes that is associated with the measurement of the variation of the measurement in the SAM tissue. And there are also some other phenotypes we are interested in, like the height of the maze, the length of the leaves, the blossom and uh, also some other things and we just pick one of this phenotype and to guide some to use some statistical methodology to guide a better choice for the certain genotypes of course our work can be extended to 
other phenotypes, but we just pick one as our problem of interest. Great. And then, so is the connection between your work with corn and looking at the yield and growth of corn and other phenotypic elements of that, is it connected to your new work on medical imaging and neuroimaging because of the sparse nature of the data and there's a good relationship between those two? Yeah, it's a very good catch of this connection. Um, during these projects for the study on the coins, I learned something about statistical genetics. And also, we performed some sparse learning for this work. And as, because we know the, for the genomics of the plant, there are thousands and millions of the genes we are looking to. And we need to select the important genes that are connected to certain features. And when we are conducting the precision medicine things, the first project I'm working on is related with the imaging genetic study. So we both look at the images and the genetic things. And we need to also select the important genetic factors that are related with certain things we are care about, the variable of interest. So that's how I can connect it to the work I have done before. So just to be clear, you aren't just working on the imaging aspect of the brain images, but you actually do have genomic data as well that you are using? Yes, I work on both. Uh, the first project I'm, I will introduce later is about imaging genetic study. That is, in my work, I look into both the imaging data and genetics data. Cool. And so is the idea that for a given patient that you have their brain imaging and then you also have their genomic data and you are obviously then that's a very high dimensional problem because you have all the dimensionality of the imaging plus all the dimensionality of the genomics data? Yes, you also get a good catch. We have like both high dimensionality for the imaging data and high dimensionality for the genomics data. And there is a term for these things. It is called big data squared. Because we are saying we are in the era of big data, but here is the problem we are faced with. We have both big data for two different kinds of data set. So it is called big data squared. And it also, we are faced with several new challenges in dealing with these things in both theoretical and the computation. Yeah, definitely. When you mentioned the bit that you have genomic data in addition to your imaging, sort of the first thing that popped in my mind was like, some Kronecker product between an image pixels and all the pixels in an image plus basically a like a giant genome SNP binary data vector across all these patients. So yeah, I definitely think that you're essentially multiplying time sparsity and features. Yes, we have the sparsity in the genomics data. And yes, we are working on the SNP data in the imaging genetics study. In this project, I will introduce later. So we can go into the detail later, I think, in the second part. Yeah, sounds good. What were the other projects that you were working on? I will also give a like, brief introduction for another two projects I'm currently working on. Specifically for the imaging genetics data we are working on, it's about a 2D image. So that means what we are working on, it is a 2D image instead of 3D. But as we know, in the... With currently the advancement of imaging techniques, usually we can collect a lot of 3D images like fMRI or PET image or some other type of images. So if we can work on the 3D image itself, it can give us a better guide and better idea what's the structure behind the images and what we can find the interesting like connection between the regions inside those images. So one work I'm currently working on is about 3D image. And uh, the problem we are working on is to find out the significance regions that is related with certain disease. As one kind of like parallel things in statistics is when we fit some linear model or some other models, we can build up the confidence interval for the parameters of, for the certain things statistic we are interested in. And we can extend this idea to the 3D image. That is, we can build up a confidence region for the disease factors. 
And that's the one work we are currently working on. And another one is about in the original imaging genetic study in this project, we do not consider about the treatment effect. So I want to also incorporate the treatment effect and see how we can use the imaging features to guide a better decision, a better option for the treatment. There's also one term for this study. It is called treatment regime study. So that's what I'm currently working on for another project that is related. And so on the issue of the treatment studies, is the challenge that in addition to the sparsity of the various features that you have for a patient, that the number of treatments, it's very difficult because essentially you can only apply one treatment to a given patient. So it's difficult to discern what is a treatment specific effect versus what is simply in the patient's what is just an effect of the patient's genetic or brain image profile? Well, for this data we are currently working on is we do not have enough sample size for the, for the group with treatment. The problem we are interested in is that we won't see like uh, there's one group that's without treatment and there are some group with treatment. And we can see there are some like genetic factors, some other risk factors that can use to guide a treatment. And also, following this idea, we think imaging could also be one of features we should consider to incorporate uh, the use of the treatment. Like, if the people is diagnosed without any disease, then the imaging for these people should be different with a patient that is diagnosed with certain disease. So following this idea, we want to use this imaging as kind of diagnostic tool to guide a bad treatment. The biggest challenge we have faced now, uh, one thing in terms of methodology is that how, what's the good way to incorporate this image in our idea? That is how we can use this image. As you have mentioned, the imaging also, um, is usually with high dimensionality. And we need to like find out a good way to incorporate it. And the second thing is whether we can extract some useful or efficient information out of this imaging that are provided. As we see, the imaging also is with measurement errors when we are getting this data. How can we extract some useful information from these imaging things? That's another challenge for us when we are dealing with these things. And also in terms of computation, how can we guide a very efficient algorithm when we're dealing with this data? And in terms of the data set, as I just mentioned, the big challenge we are faced with is we do not have the data set we are currently working on do not have enough large sample size. We only have like hundreds of patients with the treatment or without treatment and with some images. Um, certainly, if we can have some larger data set, it will guide better like result. So that's this challenges we are faced with in terms of methodology, the computation, and in practice. Well, Xinyi, you've brought up several very interesting issues. One which I am particularly interested to hear about more is when a patient has been diagnosed with a particular disease, that there's an effect that you can see manifested in the physiology of the brain and the image of the brain that you have. So it'd be interesting to talk about that a bit more, but also the issue of measurement noise uh, specific to your imaging technology. It'd be fun to hear more about that in sort of the ways that you're using statistical methods to answer it. But the first question first, could you give us an example of when you have a patient who's diagnosed with a particular disease? What shows up in their brain image? What are the things that you look for? Yeah, that's a very good question. So looking specifically in detail to our project, the disease we analyze is uh, Alzheimer disease. And as we know, Alzheimer disease is more and more common in the age and early age people. And for it causes a lot of troubles to the patient itself and to the family that care about the patients. And uh, as we know, when people suffer from Alzheimer's disease, they have a lot of symptoms for the dementia, like some memory loss, difficulty in performing daily tasks, 
and have some language issues and so on. And if we look at the images, the brain images for these people, for example, we can look at fMRI image, MRI image, or PET image. And the image we look at is a PET image. Very quickly, for those who aren't familiar with the different imaging modalities, could you please tell us what fMRI and a PET scan are, sort of how they differ in the ways that they measure and quantify brain activity? FMI is short for functional magnetic resonance images, or we call it functional MI. And PET image is short for the positron emission tomography. And there are two different kinds of modality for the images. So for FMI, it's more measured for the functional or structural for the brain. And for PET image, it measures the brain activity level for the region it scanned. And so what are the different aspects of Alzheimer's and the effect of Alzheimer's in the brain that these different modalities are picking up? Yes, like the images we are dealing with is a PET image. It reveals the activity level for the certain brain regions. And if we, and also I'll show it in the part two, if we look into a normal people, and uh, people with diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, we can see there will be a significant difference in the activity level in different regions for the brain. And we can tell that these regions are certainly associated with certain functions for the brains that is related with like a normal activity and the languages. So it's of great interest. And so is the idea that for patients with Alzheimer's that you're seeing a reduced amount of functionality or a reduced amount of activity in those specific areas of the brain? Yes. If we look further for the regions, there will be some like reduced activity level in the brains. And But we also check with our collaborators in neurology and they told us that about to our intuition, we think for the people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, there will be some like decrease of activity level in a certain region. But according to like their professional opinion, there could be some upside opinion. That is, there could be some like abnormal increasing of active level in a certain region. So it is like important to detect both abnormal decreasing and increasing in the different regions. Yeah, that's really interesting. Actually, on that issue, back at SDSS 2018, I believe it was, I saw the, one of the keynote speakers gave a really cool video of brain activity when a person goes under anesthesia. And it was very interesting because generally you'd think, oh, if the person's asleep, there should be less brain activity. But actually, the brain activity rapidly increased. It actually had a lot more activity. And that's how they could tell that the patient was actually under and properly under anesthesia. It is one of those interesting aspects about the clinical subject matter that even though we generally think of something like dementia as decreasing brain activity, that you could actually see increases in certain regions, regardless of how the actual disease manifests in the person's behavior. So that's really cool. And are there areas where you've identified new places where a clinician didn't know to look, sort of new areas where there was either a, there's some type of change in activity or morphology in the brain that you brought to clinicians' attention? Yes. Like in the project of the imaging genetic study, we both need to select the features or the risk factors that we think associated with the variation of the brain images. And also we want to show that the imaging maps that are associated with certain factors. And we show this plot and our findings to our collaborator in neurology. And uh, because we have detected some like new genotypes that has not been reviewed in the research before, they think that's a very interesting result. And it may take several years for them to verify the result. And the region associated with the risk factor, they think they are also very interesting. And there are some certain theories that support our findings. And so I'm curious, when you are looking to identify 
these genetic markers associated with a disease like Alzheimer's? Is it simply to have a better idea of who has the highest chance or who has the highest predisposition to having the disease? There are some like well-known genetics that is associated with Alzheimer's disease, like the APOE, that people with certain APOE allele that will have like 13 to 14 times higher the proportion to get the Alzheimer's disease than the normal people. And our goal is, first, the one thing is to find out whether there are some other genes that could be also associated with the onset for the Alzheimer's disease. And so we are also interested in some interactive effects between the genes to other risk factors that already know, like we know the gender could have some effect for the Alzheimer's disease that male or female may have different ratio. And also the age have some effect about the disease. So we are also interested in some interactive effects between the genetic factors and these risk factors. So that are two things that I think might be of great interest to researchers. And following up on one of the issues that you had mentioned earlier is also the noise, the measurement noise when you're doing these brain imaging activities. Can you talk a little bit about what this noise is, what it looks like, and what it comes from? Yes, we treat this noise as a measurement error, like taken from the data. So when we are dealing with this, measurement error in the imaging data. The statistical tool we use is the functional data analysis. That is, we treat all these images as uh, functionals. That is a realization for some stochastic process with errors. And so we use functional data analysis tool to dealing with these errors. And I also introduced some details in the part two. Cool. And what causes these measurement errors? Is it something like the patient moving when the imaging is taking place? Or is it more to do with actual dynamics of the brain while the measurements are occurring? Or is it something to do with more like the device and the corruptions and interruptions with the device's ability to measure? What causes these measurement errors? I think the factors you just mentioned all contribute to these errors. So if the arrows is caused by like some random movement taken from the machine, then this arrow we should exclude it from our analysis. But if the arrow is caused by some dynamic things from the brain activity, then it is valuable. We should consider to incorporate it in our analysis. So it's also the reason we use functional data analysis tool. We will like divide the arrow into two parts. One part is a random noise, and another part is we think it is subject-related errors, and we want to extract some useful information from it. Well, Yi, this is all really interesting, and having done my homework a bit, I noticed the fact that you have some really cool images from your work coming up, so I don't want to delay those any further. Let's jump over to part two. So if you've been listening to audio for this part, Don't miss out on the video section, for example, on YouTube when it comes to the next part, because there's some really cool stuff, a really cool presentation that Xinyi has prepared, and be ashamed to miss out on it. So, Xinyi, see you in the next part. Thank you, Glenn. See you next part. Well, that's it for this episode of The Pod of Asclepius. We hope you enjoyed it and will tune in for our next episode. If you're watching from YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and leave a like. You can also follow us on our other social media channels, including LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Have a great story or presentation that's ready for prime time, or know someone who does? Drop Glenn an email because he'd be happy to hear from you. We would like to thank our sponsors from the American Statistical Association section on Statistical Learning and Data Science, section on Medical Devices and Diagnostics, and North Carolina Chapter. The views expressed on the show are those of the speaker and not their employers, our sponsors or anyone else not saying the words.